effort. Though the Allies have now left most of the Rhine far behind, it was on the second day of the surge over that river that Winston Churchill crossed it in person. Naturally, he got a tremendous reception from everyone, and it was indeed a great moment for him after all these long years of tireless leadership, from the days when we stood alone right up to the present collapse of Germany's western defences. In the smashing of those defences, British commandos had played an outstanding part. The enemy had concentrated many of the best forces available against Monty's 21st Army Group, and the Germans certainly fought hard at Basel. Even after its capture, the commandos had plenty of work on hand, dealing with snipers and cleaning up isolated groups of the enemy in the neighbourhood. Yes, there had been most violent and bitter fighting before the British finally burst out of their east of the Rhine bridgehead to drive on north and east into central Germany. An impression of American paratroops on their way down. Allied airborne forces also took their objectives in the manner and at the speed that had been planned. Their gallant work fitted neatly into the general jigsaw of the great offensive, and one of the earliest communiques told us that they had linked up with commandos and other ground forces. Paratroops and glider troops, British and American, they all played a terrific part in cracking open Germany's Rhine defences. Men of the Oxford and Bucks, among others, landed almost on top of their objectives, which included bridges across the small river Easel. Already the Allied advance had swept on far ahead of this point, and Monte had clamped down a security blackout on news from his part of the front. But in towns and villages already overrun, the troops were very busy dealing with German civilians as well as prisoners of war. Most reports told of the submissive attitude of civilians, many of whom brought out the old, old story of how they really hated the Nazis and never had wanted a war. Certainly, they can never have wanted this kind of war. Today, their homeland is being occupied, and they watch their soldiers being marched away as prisoners. At one place, they began to loot a warehouse, which was full of food and stores left behind by the German army. If anybody starves, it won't be the Germans. That used to be one of Goering's many boasts. But now, apparently, German civilians are beginning to realize the possibility of starvation for them. Some of them got away with their loot. But the Americans soon put a stop to it and made the rest of them return what they'd stolen. The Huns are accustomed to receiving many orders and to obeying them. Well, now they're getting orders from the Allies. Here at Schwanheim, they read that the Nazi party has been dissolved. And, as instructed, they brought their radios to the main square. They also handed over an assortment of weapons and equipment. It doesn't look as if the werewolf idea has caught on in these parts. Meanwhile, the advance on all sectors of the front had been going like lightning, and, except when weather made it impossible, retreating German convoys were being pounded and smashed from the air. Tremendous toll was taken on many so-called escape roads, while the Allied armies were closing round the German Army Group B in the Ruhr. No, most decidedly, this was not the kind of war German civilians or soldiers had wanted or expected. Instead, it was the beginning of the end of Hitler's Reich, supposed to last, you remember, at least a thousand years. For the prisoners now streaming back across the Rhine, as for all Germans, the future is already the past.